Hi guys, I'm Antonia and uh, I work uh, as a front-end developer and technical trainer here in Softuni. And uh, our guest today is Lubomir, a cybersecurity expert who has been working uh, on many years um, on cybercrime investigations with countries across uh, Europe, the United States, uh, Russia, New Zealand and others. Hi, Lubu, and uh, welcome to today's podcast. Do you want to introduce yourself? and tell us something more about yourself. Thank you, Antonia. First of all, let me thank uh, all, all of you guys uh, joining us here at this podcast. I hope uh, it will be interesting to you. And uh, I'm looking forward to really in this interesting uh, interview together here with uh, Antonia. Um, so a couple of words about myself. Uh, yeah, I'll try to, you know, get rid of looking at the camera. Um, so my name is Lubomir Tulev and, you know, I've started my career back in 2010, actually, when I first uh, started um, as a cybercrime investigator, um, a position within our national cybercrime units. Um, and just, you know, two years later, I became the, the team leader of this of this group. Uh, basically, me and my team, we have been dealing with uh, cybercrime investigations and uh, international and international perspectives, uh, meaning that we, we had a lot of opportunities to you know, work uh, together with a lot of colleagues from, from entire Europe, uh, the United States, New Zealand, Russia, um, just to name a few of them. Um, moreover, back in 2015, uh, I've been recognized as one of the you know, uh, top 10 international cyber crime investigators globally by FBI. So I've became part of their international task force members, which actually gave the Bulgarian, the Bulgarian cyber crime department a lot of opportunities. And we have been able to, you know, get a list of a lot of information coming and going through the FBI uh, liaison officers. Um, and, you know, um, seven years spent there uh, at at some stage, I, I decided just, you know, to, to move forward and, and basically to start growing my career. And it was very organic, actually, to, to move and to, uh, to switch now to the private sector where I'm currently involved in a private company. And um, basically, I'm dealing with cyber, um, cyber security. Um, and in this company where I currently uh, am employed, I, I do penetration testing, social engineering, I do consultancy, uh, cyber forensics, um, trainings. And here's the moment actually to just to mention that I'm also a trainer within this soft tuning, which I'm very proud of. Um, and yeah, that's briefly about myself. Okay, I'm uh, curious to know what inspired you to become a cybersecurity expert. So how did it all start? Well, um, the fact that I've been involved in the police structure for seven years means that uh, I've been forced to inspire in, you know, this feeling of helping and protecting people. And um, my education is um, I've graduated as a bachelor degree in our police, National Police Academy. Somehow I became the, the first, the, the best cadet in the, in the class, uh, which actually um, we had uh, in the police academy this, uh, this rule. Uh, whoever is the first, the best cadet in the class, he has the chance to choose where exactly to start to work within the Ministry of uh, Interior in the next 10 years. So, uh, yeah, this was uh, back in 2010 and, and I just decided, well, this should be the cybercrime investigations. So I first started with cybercrime investigations with helping, protecting people. But, you know, uh, as I already have mentioned, when, when I reached a level where, you know, working with the police uh, somehow, you know, gave me this um, framework and I just wanted to, you know, go outside of this framework. And, and to grow. And to grow, indeed. And this was the, the summer of 2017, where I've met, um, I, I drank a coffee with a very good friend of mine. And, you know, I just, you know, very briefly talked with him uh, about my, my ideas, uh, basically to start looking for new opportunities outside of the place. And, and I was really, I didn't have any idea actually what to do outside of the police. Uh, first of all, my idea maybe came to start work as a quality assurance uh, engineer. Mm -hmm. So to start work with the QA. Uh, but then when I talked to him and he said, well, QA, if you are not really a developer, if you have never been dealing with that, <laughs> yeah. probably might be really tough for you. Well, and I said, well, what exactly to start with in this case? Uh, and he said, well, why not you just continue doing the same thing what you've done here in, uh, in the police seven years? 
but just do this in the private sector. And I said, well, but I cannot do policing in the private sector. And he said, policing not, but cyber uh, security is what you can do in the private sector. Mm. So basically, he was the person, uh, and back to your question, what has expired me, <laughs> I will transform the question who has expired me. And uh, and exactly this was this friend of mine who actually just gave me this idea to you know, uh, continue being doing what I have been doing in the police, but now in the private perspective. And uh, very organically, I, I just, you know, moved and, and now I'm dealing with cyber security as a consultancy and helping actually the same way as I have been, uh, you know, doing this in the police, helping people. Now I do this, but helping companies and as well, and, uh, and of course, uh, people as well, but helping them straighten more their cyber security. Okay, uh, nice. Um, so given the current situation, um, uh, what advice can you give to all people that are working remotely now and uh, are working from their homes? Yeah, uh, well, the pandemic coronavirus spread away across the, the globe uh, is, is really, you know, actually the one positive thing out of this is that um, this gives us a lot of opportunities to to furthermore um, rediscover uh, the opportunities of of digitalization of transformation of the, our digital lives um, and we see that with especially within the ministry of education um, just uh, the, the teachers in the country they just needed a couple of days yeah. to totally shift their way of teaching uh, with uh, their students uh, remotely and um, we have a, a very, you know, kind of um, Bulgarian way of saying whatever cannot be done by the easy way can be done by the hard <laughs> way. And actually the coronavirus uh, made exactly this. A lot of the businesses, a lot of um, um, companies, they have been pushed to just switch to remote working. So uh, the, maybe the only positive thing out of the coronavirus is that actually um, this gave us a lot of uh, way, uh, another way of thinking of um, doing the same thing, but now remotely, which on the other side possess a lot of disadvantages mm -hmm. and a lot, a lot of obstacles. And they came from, um, they're coming the obstacles from, uh, from the hackers. Just the same way as we are pushed to stay at our homes, it means that the hackers, which generally we are trying to get them out of their homes, not to make, you know, uh, bad things. Now they're pushed to stay at their homes and we have to think about this because the, those people, the black hat hackers, staying in their homes, they don't have any anything else to do except just, you know, start attacking um, our infrastructure, our business, our, um, our computers, our devices. So that's why when we talk about uh, remote working, we have to, you know, follow very, very basic measures and, and uh, rules for as we, the professionals, call it cyber hygiene uh, for cyber security. The first thing is um, we have to think about how do we get internet connection in our homes? The easy way is just, you know, using a Wi-Fi router. So first we have to think about securing the Wi-Fi router. I've seen in my career many people are, you know, they're putting uh, passwords uh, so easy guessable, like uh, their phone numbers or... Uh, ID numbers yeah. or uh, I don't know. Or just, one, two, three, four. <laughs> yeah, for instance. So this kind of password is not secured at all. And we have to uh, know that, you know, um, using uh, software tools like um, Hydra, for instance, one of the penetration testing tools, mm -hmm. it can happen just in about a minute to break this kind of password. So the very first barrier of this layered defense, which we have to build up in our homes, is really to construct and to secure our router. First of all, to use um, one of the, you know, the, the hardest possible um, protection and encryption. So the VPA2 encryption uh, protocol. And secondly, to really construct a password, which is complicated. At least what I can suggest, 12 uh, characters long uh, and a combination of uh, small and capital letters, digits and special characters. So securing our Wi-Fi connection and not just one securing, but also keep monitoring which are the connected devices to our router. This will bring us information if somebody is trying to access our, our, uh, our network. So securing the Wi-Fi network is one step. The second one 
Being in our home, we need actually to access um, the, the infrastructure of our business. So how we can achieve that? Through VPNs. Uh, it's not so easy. I mean, um, it, it's really ridiculous if you let your employees to access your infrastructure without using a virtual private network solution, just because everybody can just uh, um, interact and can snip the uh, for sensitive information coming from your home to your infrastructure. So using VPN clients is must is a mandatory. Um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, VPN solutions are available out there on the market. So just you know, um, look for it and try to deploy a VPN solution so that all your employees who are working now remotely can access through the VPN the infrastructure of your business. And this you will ensure actually that your infrastructure is, is safe and you can provide secured connection between your core servers and your uh, employees working remotely. On the other hand, um, also, we need to secure our endpoint device. So meaning the computer, the tablet, and even the our mobile device, if it's um, a business property. So what we can, uh, how we can achieve this here, of course, very easy way, just implementing antivirus solutions um, to, uh, to our devices, and also implementing mobile device management. Uh, mobile device management is this Part of. I'm sorry to secure the devices. You mean that we should set passwords from them and to install antivirus program? Or not, not, not only. No, okay. Well, uh, you are on the right direction to so to, to secure the the device itself. Of, of course, we have to implement this locking out automatic feature of our uh, of our devices. So not to be our you know laptop or mm -hmm. desktop monitor uh, being open to everybody who wants to access it, even if they live in our home. Still, we have to, you know, make this kind of, um, of rules so that the, our laptop will lock out automatically in, let's say, five minutes. Mm -hmm. And also to establish this kind of, you know, uh, our habits to every, every time when we uh, stand out just to lock up our laptop. And secondly, yes, installing antiviruses on our devices so that if a malware somehow has been deployed on our machine, so that the antivirus to be able to detect it and to destroy it. Although we, most of our, uh, my colleagues and myself even, we don't really believe antivirus uh, systems, but this is just our way of thinking. And, and the reason behind that is that uh, we, we think that sometimes the antiviruses, uh, antivirus softwares, they're providing us this fake way of thinking that we are secure, but mm -hmm. in fact, we are not really. And if you have a very basic uh, example, if you create the malware on yourself and just deploy it and import it into VirusTotal, for instance, you're going to see that just a couple of them can detect the, the very new created malwares, but the others, they're just not detecting it. So uh, having an antivirus on your system, you may think, okay, I'm secure, but in fact, you're not really. So the reason... Uh, what you can do in this situation is just be very careful. Just rely on your own ideas and security techniques, which you which you know. But of course, if you talk about regular users who are not cybersecurity yeah. professionals, yeah, antivirus is a way of solution. Um, and here I can open, you know, um, a, a very generic discussion about the, the person, the, kind, uh, the the employee itself. Uh, many times, many years in in our cybersecurity uh, lecture, uh, there is a saying that the employees actually are the the weakest possible chain of security within the organization. I don't really think so. My idea is that we have to look at the employees as a way of, for instance, um, firewall. So the firewall is a device, but without the proper set of rules, mm. can detect nothing. So my point is that. You have the firewall, you have the human firewall. So the employees, you have to convert them into human firewalls. Meaning that if you educate them well, if you train them well to detect attacks, then you have a perfect solution actually to protect your company and yourself itself. So invest in, 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 in really in the employees uh, integration, in the employees awareness and employees training. So to make these human firewalls applicable to your um, infrastructure as well. Um, another way of, uh, of securing the devices, as I already have mentioned, mobile device management. Uh, basically, it's a way of uh, securing your devices through installing an agent. And uh, somebody, an IT administrator, can remotely 
access your device and can control your device through implementing different policies uh, to forbidden different uh, kinds of activities on your mm. device. Or if the device has been somehow stolen, let's say it's a laptop or a, or a, or a mobile device or a cell phone, can remotely, first of all, wipe all the information on it and then secure the information. Because the device itself is just a hardware. What really matters here is, is just the information. The software, yeah. the software, the information itself. Um, we have to be very careful in terms of COVID-19 and this you know, virus infection um, that many attackers now are taking um, taking the lead of it and start uh, sending a lot of phishing emails. Um, we've seen that uh, in the last couple of days, or weeks, that more and more hackers are trying to you know, take advantage of this and basically start sending phishing emails, pretending they are coming from the World Health Organization yeah. or the government or I don't know whoever. But basically what they are trying to achieve is to first try to extract sensitive information from your site. So like asking you, uh, where have you been the last time where you have met people? And in this way, for instance, they can make a pattern, for example, where are you going, yeah. for instance, or sending you a PDF file or a Word document saying, here's the basic rules of uh, better protection, download and follow the rules. But in fact, it could be easily actually a malware, it could be a macro virus or whatever. And just by deploying it on your computer, you can easily be okay, become infected. But how can you know which information is fake and which one is not? Um, you're opening a very interesting topic of how we can detect a phishing mail. Yeah. So how we can understand where the information is uh, is true or false is another topic. Okay. And um, unfortunately, you know, there was a, a research last year, which unfortunately shows that Bulgarians are on the last uh, place of people in the within the European Union, Union who can actually detect which information is true or false. So uh, we really have to work harder on this to, you know, to uh, make ourselves confident how to, um, uh, how to, how to understand which information is true and which is false. Um, a very basic idea is just to double check or triple check this information from three different sources, for instance, like the uh, journalists are doing. So not to believe on one uh, and only source of information, but just double or triple check this information. On the other hand, how to detect whether a, um, an email can be a phishing, uh, can be phish mail or not. First of all, um, we have to know that uh, those guys, the hackers, they're really following this, ten, uh, this trendy kind of you know, uh, activities. So every time when we have something trendy going on uh, globally, we first have, have to think about this might be something fishy. Mm. So for instance, last year, you remember uh, this uh, big hack, a breach of information from the National Revenue Agency here in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. Just days later, the hackers started sending phishing mails uh, saying you have uh, your information has been disclosed yeah. because of this hack. Click here to secure all information or something like this way. So every time when we have something trendy, be very careful in the next couple of days, weeks. On the other hand, usually the phishing mails they're giving this sense of urgency. Uh, we see that uh, your account has been locked out, or we have detected, uh, for instance. Um, abnormal activity to your account. Click here to secure your password. Click here to secure your account. So if you get this or um, the last... You get this serious. <laughs> absolutely. So <laughs> when you have this kind of urgency feeling, um, the idea behind this urgency is really the hackers want to um, make you not have enough time to think carefully about this. Uh, so when you feel this sense of urgency, just step away, think very carefully. All right, let me think what will happen if I do not follow what is uh, what I'm instructed here. Um, so this is the right way of thinking. On the other hand, usually the phishing mails are three different types. The first type are phishing mails and the vast majority of them are phishing mails with attachments. Mm -hmm. So phish mails sending uh, different attachments like PDF files, Word documents or ISO files, for instance, and what's here the very critical, and this is very trendy since the um, the autumn from uh, 2019 to now, 
Um, many attackers are sending ISO files just because with the new version of uh, Windows uh, Windows 10 operating system. Yeah, you can see the extension. Um, first and the second, if you just double click on the ISO file, it will be automatically oh. virtualized as a virtual disk and it will be mounted to your operating system mm -hmm. and meaning plug and play automatically executed. So that be very careful when you see ISO file um, about the extensions. Um, that's another idea. For instance, the file could be uh, called uh, whatever dot ISO, uh, sorry, uh, whatever dot uh, exe dot PDF mm. or uh, sorry, my and mistake. And by default, you can see the extension in Windows. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the file will be called whatever dot PDF dot exe. And when you have this in Windows operating systems, um, in the folder uh, uh, rule not to see an already known extensions, you will not see the exe, you will just see the PDF. Yeah. So be very careful with that. So my suggestion, go to the folder options and try to uncheck to hide the known extensions because in this way you cannot see the real extension of the file. And secondly, whenever you have a attachment in a, PDF, in a, you know, in a mail, um, just download the attachment, but do not open it. Just go and check it with uh, publicly available free resources like virus portal, for instance. So upload the file within a couple of seconds, you will understand whether this is a virus or not in a very basic one, once again, uh, checks. Um, the other second uh, popularity of the phishing mails is when they have uh, not an attachment, but embedded or include a fish link. So basically they have a link which uh, just by following the link, you are redirected to a page, most of the cases, of course, phishing page, where you will be requested to provide your credentials or your credit card information or whatsoever. So when you see a URL attached in the body of your mail, and no matter if it's written, I don't know, softuni.bg, you know that this might be just a hyperlink behind this text, it might be something different, not what is written there. So my advice here, without clicking, just pointing the mouse over the hyperlink mm -hmm. of the of the text, for instance, softony.bg, on the bottom left corner of your browser, it will be written the place, the URL, where you will be redirected as soon as you click on this link. And when you see that in the text of the mail, uh, it talks about uh, softony.bg, but in fact, in the bottom left corner, you see something totally different, then just do not click it. Uh, and the third, um, third fish mail. And maybe the HTTP uh, protocol that uh, provide the website, is that important? Check it. Uh, absolutely. HTTP so, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, be very uh, careful. Look for websites which are with SSL uh, um, uh, certificate embedded. So do not provide any sensitive information in the normal uh, HTTP uh, website just because whatever you provide there can be easily sniffed because the uh, the information is transmitted in a clear text. Uh, so that's really a gap, uh, mm -hmm. a vulnerability in the security. So always look for the HTTPS uh, to have the, your website and also check the domain uh, history. Who owns the domain, where the domain has been hosted from the previous uh, years, when the domain has been registered, whether it has been registered in a, before a couple of days or it has a history of a couple of years. Also, you can check the historical way uh, how the, the website has been uh, presented through a website which is well known archive.org. So you can see how the website has been seen in, in the previous years. And when you collect all of this information about the website, when it's uh, protected, when it has a history, when you know the information, who is behind this website, then, and once you again, you can give something. You can give <laughs> something as a, you know, as an information uh, which you are asked. And the third, which is the least really possible way of uh, phishing mails is when you don't have any attachments, when you don't have any URLs, but um, the email, the, the text itself is asking you to give back to reply on information which might be uh, you know crucial and confidential for you or for for the company where you work so in this scenario take a look of uh, the reply to it's a very common way of the attack vector when the attackers are spoofing the email address where they are sending the mail from 
for instance, I can easily spoof the email and I can, you know, pretend that I am uh, sending an email on behalf of you without even you being aware of that. But when I want to get back the information, if the user reply to this mail, mm -hmm. the information will go directly to you, but I don't have access to your mail account. So what the attackers are doing here in the reply to, they're specifying their real email address where they can receive this information. So open the email header, open the email header, yeah, and you're see. gonna, absolutely, you're gonna observe where, uh, for instance, the email came from Antonia, but in fact, the reply to goes to Lubomir. So in this case, do not reply to, because this information will not go to you, who is the requester of this information, but with somebody else. So these are um, some of the techniques how we can detect the phishing mails. And also, sometimes they're trying to make them be very luxury uh, and, uh, for instance, providing uh, logos, official looking way of pretending so that, that the, the, uh, the mail is, is really legitimate. So like uh, putting um, a signature, a legitimate signature, uh, where they can get the signature from uh, the sales department, for instance. So if I pretend to be a customer and if I write to soft Tony to the sales department or the contact department, they will reply me with probably their signature. So I can get the signature from there mm -hmm. and then I can use to create my own fish mail and to start attacking your Yes, client. but I didn't understand this one. You, you want to uh, say that um, someone can send emails like from my mail the same or it has some differences. Exactly the same. And this technique is called spoofing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the, it's a little creepy. <laughs> it is creepy. And uh, unfortunately, you cannot detect this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you see that it's coming from, well, you can detect, but it relies a lot of uh, cybersecurity um, way of understanding. It's not, so <laughs> not so easy for the regular people. Mm -hmm. uh, for the more com uh, sophisticated users, how you can understand that is through um, the email header. So when you open the email header, no matter it's written that it's coming from Antonia, whatever, at Softuni BG, for instance, you can easily observe what is the IP address of the server. Mm -hmm. And when you check the server behind the Softuni.bg, and when you get the IP, for instance, is in Bulgaria, but when you get in the email header that the server, which this mail came from, is somewhere in the I don't know, uh, Philippines, for instance, yeah. then this is the clue. Yes, but you can't uh, check all the emails that you received. <laughs> Just, <laughs> you have to have this feeling. Yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact. So, um, you know, uh, it, it, sound, it, it sounds really um, maybe complex, but believe me, when you, uh, when you already has established this kind of habits uh, as the cybersecurity professionals we have, it's just a way of, you know, uh, something totally regularly for, for us. Uh, so we can inspect this kind of phishing mails in just a couple of seconds and mm -hmm. to, to get this feeling that it's a phishy mail. So back to the, our main topic about the coronavirus and working remotely, be very careful about phishing mails just because they can try with those kinds of mails to get to, to reach your, uh, your device to deploy a malware, so to infect your device, and the fact that you are accessing an infrastructure of your business, then means that you can actually compromise your entire business. And here's what what is the uh, what are the disadvantages? Um, is that when you have 100 employees working on the same space in the same building of uh, your company, then you just need to secure this company infrastructure. But when you have 100 employees working in their homes, mm -hmm. this means 100 opportunities more for the hacker. And meaning that he doesn't have now just the chance to attack the infrastructure of the company, but now he has possibility to attack all of these 100 employees. So you really have to become a human firewall to protect the infrastructure of your business. Um, what else can I advise here is, uh, accept the, the phishing mails, accept the VPN network, accept the Wi-Fi protection, accept the mobile device management. On the other hand, when we work remotely, we can use this time for our future improvements and cybersecurity awareness. So it's a, it's a kind of, um, you know, idea to everybody, to the employers who are listening to us and watching us right now. Give the opportunity, give the chance to your employees during this time to furthermore raise their uh, their awareness. 
So provide them a lot of uh, video trainings, modules. So to teach them really to detect all of these possible vector of uh, attack vectors. Yeah, it's important to provide some training about this. It is important, and in in relation to the cyber crimes, so to to prevent the cyber crimes, a couple of statistics. For instance, uh, for uh, 2015, uh, the cyber crimes cost globally was estimated as three trillion US dollars. Mm. And now for 2000, uh, now for 2020 uh, uh, year, uh, Europol uh, estimates that uh, by the end of uh, this year, the, the cost globally for the cyber crimes will be la something like uh, six trillion US dollars. So which means double just for five years. Um, and, and the reason is very obstacle. We, we see a lot of rise in, uh, in ransomware attacks and ransomware for those of our, um, listeners and, uh, and, uh, students who are listening to us will just, uh, say a few words that ransomware is this type of attack where, uh, it's a kind of virus. So it's a subcategory of viruses where actually you are infecting the, somebody's computer. Mm -hmm. And just by this infection, you are encrypting all the files, which are present which uh, this computer possess so all the files there they still remain there but they are encrypted so you cannot do anything with them you cannot open in them you, mm -hmm. you yeah unless so for what you can use them <laughs> wow all right so here, here's the answer and uh, the answer is in the way of uh, the attack it's called ransomware so these encrypted files in order to decrypt them mm -hmm. you're asked for a ransom so your background on the desktop has been is being changed, and usually there's uh, a sentence in, in English saying that well you have been hacked with uh, ransomware. In order to get your files back decrypted, you have to pay a ransom, a money, mm -hmm. and here's the Bitcoin wallet which you have to send the money to. Um, usually uh, there's, I mean the the, the ransom really vary, uh, but sometimes it uh, varies between. 0.5 to 1 bitcoin per uh, per attack and right now one bitcoin is uh, is being uh, traded for uh, 6.5 thousand uh, like us dollars yeah. yeah something like this one so it's a lot of money actually yeah. to, to get your files back and what was what is more even ridiculous and this is really um so if i don't want to decrypt my files <laughs> well then you are just losing your files um, mm -hmm. the, the protection behind this is regular backups, or totally regular yeah. backups. And, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but when you create a backup file, do not store it on the same device. Store it somewhere on, a, on the cloud. Maybe in some cloud, yeah. In the cloud or external hard drives, because, you know, being a part of the police when I worked there, um, and this kind, this kind of attack started uh, back in 2014, something like that. So they're not so trendy right now. They're very old way of attacks, but um, we had a lot of companies, a lot of businesses coming to, uh, to, to the, our police structure and saying, we have been hacked by ransomware, but the good thing is that we have a backup. And I was, all right, that's great. So where's the backup? Well, it's on the same device yeah, right here. So absolutely, <laughs> it's, so it will be encrypted uh, as well. Um, so the the rescue here is is to have a backup stored somewhere uh, mm -hmm. remotely on a cloud on external hard drive, and this backup should be um, accurate. So maybe if you ask me what does it mean accurate, I would say at least once per week. Yeah. Um, and secondly, really to have a very good antiviruses so that they can detect this. And once again, you have to become a, um, a human firewall so to to detect this way of attacking your machine so to better protect. What is even more painful now starting in 2020 is that so far the attack was just related with infecting your files, um, paying the ransom. And here's the tricky part. Even if you pay the ransom, nobody can guarantee that you get the decryption yes. key back just because they are hackers. So they <laughs> they really want to get the money and they don't really care about you your know, files. Absolutely, your files. So basically, if you are infected with ransomware, you're screwed up if you don't have a backup. Yeah. So my advice, never pay the ransom. Nobody can guarantee you that they will give you back the decryption key. You'll just lose some money. Um, but 
this was with the ransom. And now with 2020, what we see is that it's getting more and more popular, not just your files to be encrypted. So that's why we call it ransomware 2.0. But your files, while being encrypted, they're also copied on the hacker's machine. Mm -hmm. And even if you pay the ransom or not, this information is being provided for selling in the dark market, in the dark net. Yeah. And you can imagine that um, if, uh, if a, a very big company... How can you understand that information is leaked on the other computer of the hacker? Can just, you? just with the fact that you are infected with this ransomware, mm -hmm. you have to know that already this hacker has access to your files. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you are infected, this hacker has access to your files. It wasn't really interesting for them to, you know, to sell this information so far, just because they were really about caring about money. Mm -hmm. But what they see now is that people are not paying the money, the ransom, uh, much more like before. And that's why what they really care is just, you know, to get some money from. So they're selling this money, uh, sorry, this information to competitors in the dark market, for mm -hmm. instance. So you can imagine if a, a big organization, um, which deals with the millions of uh, potential users with their personal data, information, medical information, ex yeah. uh, especially, what kind of a breach this might be if they are infected with a ransomware uh, virus, for instance. I'll just uh, remind um, everybody who listens to us now that uh, back in 2016, there was one very popular ransomware, which is called uh, WannaCry. Maybe you've heard about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Petya then later on, but WarCry uh, infected over 60% of the entire hospitals and medical system in UK. So you can imagine what kind yeah. of bi a million of information about million of users of, uh, of people there has been, has been encrypted. The good thing is that this information hasn't been stolen. Well, uh, we'll say that yeah. uh, nobody can guarantee, um, but uh, yeah, the ransomware should be very careful about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, in general, not only in the current situation, what are the most common attacks on the average user? Well, um, definitely when we talk about the business, the ransomware, that's mm. what we see here. This infection with ransomware, encrypting files, this is really the average. The, the, the vast majority of the cases which we are dealing with, uh, being part of the police and now in the private sector, that's what I face almost every second or third time with a company facing different problems. On the other part, another attacks which may happen to, to businesses, to people, are usually uh, related with their credentials and hacking their different profiles and tenants in different uh, cloud storages, for instance. And it, it is related with your way of uh, creating passwords and behaving with passwords and possessing and storing and protecting your passwords because people are being very easily hacked their facebook profiles their mailboxes on the other side uh, businesses very easily they can be compromised there for instance accounts in i don't know some of the major cloud uh, platforms and so be very careful with the passwords and um, and, and the passwords, they're related with several attacks. So credentials, uh, harvesting, uh, password spraying. On the other hand, uh, brute forcing. Um, if you have, a, for instance, web application and the logging portal is not secured with a strong password, as I already have mentioned, the Hydra, for instance, is a tool which can easily break this password protection with a couple of minutes or hours if the password is a little bit more complicated. So be very careful with the passwords. That's the major, um, the major, uh, you know, advice here, except the ransomware. Um, what else? Uh, the availability of the information. So we as a cybersecurity professionals, that's what we say to our customers that we already, we, we always have to think about three elements of the information. It's confidentiality, it's integrity, and it's availability. So the first thing, confidentiality, means that we have to protect our data at all the time, at any stage, not to become, you know, uh, in a possession of somebody who hasn't the right permission to access this data. Meaning that we have to back up the information all the time. We have to 
protect with different implementation of different access controls to this data. So meaning that we have to implement two-factor authentication, yeah. better passwords, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, integrity. We have to protect this information not to be changed or modified or altered by an attacker or by a person who hasn't have the right to change this data. How this can happen is uh, when we talk about developers here, also SQL, different SQL injections. Because with the F SQL injections, we can actually give access to somebody, a hacker, to get access to our uh, backend, to our database, and yeah. modify the data there. So protect your backends to protect these SQL query queries, which you can process before being processed to um, a very, very carefully being sanitized so that not to make SQL injection possible, which something what actually has happened with the National Revenue Agency. Or at least these are, SQL injection? This, these are the rumors. These are the rumors. Uh, of course, we still don't have any confirmation about that, but these are the rumors that actually it was an SQL injection mm -hmm. with one of the you know uh, very famous tools out there, SQL map. Mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, this information, the entire database actually has been dumped with uh, <laughs> with a malformed uh, SQL injection. Yeah. And the third thing, availability, meaning that we have to protect our data, our information to be available at any time when we need it. So, for instance, this morning I was supposed to have um, an, uh, a test, an exam on uh, one of the universities where uh, I study. But unfortunately, their website was down. And I was surprised because nowadays I thought that, you know, their servers might be on the cloud. And then, no, they still keep this, this information on, on prem. And basically, they were just went out of uh, electricity supply. And they said, well, unfortunately, our electricity, our electricity has been cut off. And, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, the server is not, uh, is not working currently. So I wasn't being able to access my test. Um, but you gave them free advice. So. <laughs> yeah, I gave them a free advice and it's not a really a big deal because the, the, the exam has been postponed for tomorrow. But my point is that we really have to, make sure that our business will have access to this information at any time. So these are the main advices to the business and to the, to the people to, to look for. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, currently reading uh, one book, is The Art of Deception by Kevin Mitnick. Uh, and it's really interesting. A great that, book. Yeah, uh, because um, it's a kind of examples like social engineering. And my question here is how can I protect myself from attacks like this, like uh, if some colleague from other depart department calls me and um, wants some information about the company, how can I know and uh, be aware of that? You you said it in the in the last of in the last word of your sentence. Uh, you have to be just aware of that. So the art of deception by Kevin Mitnick and Kevin Mitnick, by the way, is one of the most famous world uh, white hat hackers nowadays. Uh, in the past, he was a black hat, uh -huh. but after a couple of you know, um, he switched. <laughs> yeah, a couple of years uh, struggling uh, with the FBI and the other the, the uh, Department of Homeland Security in the states. You know, uh, he just decided to become the the bad uh, the, the the good guy now, <laughs> not the bad guy. So he switched. And by the way, he's uh, the inspiration behind one of the the best, uh, the world's most famous uh, platform for uh, cybersecurity awareness and training simulations. It's called No Before. Mm -hmm. So Kevin Mitnick is behind this project, No Before. It's American product. Um, I have a lot of experience with No Before, and I'm really a fan of Kevin Mitnick, by the way. So the art of deception is really giving you some ideas what the attackers may use in order to get advantage uh, on you. So not just the phishing mails, but also the way as they talk and as they, uh, uh, you know, uh, get in touch with you yeah. might be in a possess in a way of that they want to extract some really sensitive information out of you. So be very careful, not about the phishing mails, but also there's another, um, another examples of uh, a, a social engineering attack vectors. For instance, I will mention USB uh, devices, USB uh, flash drives might be another vector. We we had an example, we had a, a test simulation with one of our clients. Mm. Yeah, and we have created 20 USB sticks uh, infected with a, 
I wouldn't say malware, but let's say a piece of software. As soon as you plug in the USB, we understand that the device has been plugged in. Mm -hmm. And who is the uh, who is the, the person behind this? I mean, who is the device name? Which is the device name? Um, so just to make sure that uh, if it was some real malware, actually, we could infect easily the uh, the computer yeah, yeah. and and then the entire infrastructure on the on the other page. So we have created 20 USB sticks intentionally infected with this kind of piece of software for tracking. And we have thrown the USB devices just innocent looking places like conference rooms, the reception and stuff like that. Um, what was the result? What was the result is, yeah, first of all, we are in Bulgaria. So all the 20 USB devices has been stolen. So it's normal. We're in <laughs> Bulgaria. So all of them have been collected by uh, the employees of this company. But out of these 20 USB devices, five of them have been plugged to uh, the computers, which means 25%. Mm -hmm. And the reason behind that is that they are very curious. So when you have a USB stick, in uh, want in to say what absolutely, it's like. uh, and 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 just you know left on the on the conference in a conference room or on the reception, of course you would be <laughs> willing to check what is inside. And mm -hmm. I remember now another simulation which uh, was involved and uh, which we have created with another client of us. Um, we have targeted not just the reception or the sales department, which are usually the most vulnerable positions in a company, but we have targeted the IT department. So people who are supposed to know about these yeah. techniques, right? Um, so what we've done, we have sent an, a, a mail, a phishing mail presenting. So uh, a couple of words behind that. This only to the IT department? Only to the IT department. So we have sent a phishing mail. And in this mail, we spoofed the address, pretending that this mail was coming from their uh, chief executive officer. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, kind of uh, presenting a forwarded already conversation. Um, a couple of words behind that. So this company was in about of merging with another big company. And because of this merging process, uh, they were discussing about the future cuttings in the company. So the, the text in the, in the mail was something, uh, something like, something like, um, uh, guys, these were the, uh, the information about our future cuttings in the company, which we have decided. Please keep this information confident so, so now, uh, so far, so that, uh, after, a, uh, you know, future, uh, after, um, uh, a confirmation about the, the positions, then we will disseminate this information to, uh, to, to our colleagues. And you know that, uh, even if you are an IT guy, <laughs> when you get the mail with an attached Excel file, as Excel spreadsheet, and it should be uh, from the CTO, from the CEO of the company, CEO. yeah, presenting that these are possible cuttings. Of course, you would be willing to check whether you are part of this list or not. So the art of deception is really teaching you how you can take advantage of the way how the people are thinking. So USB devices, mm -hmm. phishing mails, also smishing and phishing attack vectors. Smishing, very couple of words. Um, it's a way of sending a phishing uh, information the same way with the uh, emails, but using a text message. So sending an SMS and, in, uh, and, uh, and again, you are just uh, presenting the information. Uh, for instance, your account has been compromised. Click here to secure your account and again, URL. And uh, when uh, the, the person clicks on this URL, they basically he or she gets to a phishing uh, page and, and then from the phone, once again, you can easily provide an information. And even with the, with the browsers of the phone is, is even more, it's even tougher because you cannot, uh, very well see the, the URL of, uh, of the URL link of the URL field because it's a small, tiny yeah. window. It's not like on the computers. So be very careful about the smishing attacks and what you have mentioned in the beginning of this question, phishing. It stands for voice solicitation. So voice phishing, basically. Yeah. It's a way how you can, actually call somebody presenting and pretending to be somebody else and trying to extract information. But your for, voice is not the same. Your voice is not the same, but you have to be aware that there are applications which can actually spoof your phone number the same way as you are spoofing the mail address. I can now call a friend of yours presenting that I'm calling from your phone number directly mm. to him or to her without you even being aware about it. And it's a, it's a normal uh, technique, which we are aware of. So 
even when you see that somebody uh, uh, who is a person in your contact list is calling you, you have not to be always sure that in, indeed this is this person. So the art of deception, Kevin McNick is just really teaching you about all of these ways of how people are thinking and, and just taking advantage of this. So the easy answer, just be very careful. Just you have to train the people, you have to train yourself what are the attack vectors and how to recognize them in order to better protect. Yeah, um, out of the topic, but can you uh, recommend more books about like this one uh, and we can list them in the description after that? Well, the art of deception is, is just, the, you know, the, the golden medal okay. when we talk about social engineering. Of course, if um, I cannot now remember the other titles, but if you just, you know, Google it, um, there's a lot of topics, a lot of books written on this topic of social engineering. Okay, uh, so my next question is about learning. So uh, if I want to become a cybersecurity expert, what uh, do I need to start to learn now? Uh, some programming skills, networking knowledge, and what else do I need, like technical Yeah, stuff. well, um, cybersecurity, and if you want to be really an expert, uh, I mean, if you are just a pen... Maybe the expert comes with the years of practice. But exactly, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and when you also... Um, improve your skills not vertically but horizontally what i mean when you put a lot of efforts to improve yourself in one and specific only topic on the field of cyber security yeah of course you will become an expert in this field but you will be just an expert on this field but not on cyber security generally so for instance when we talk about cyber forensics and cyber forensics is <clears throat> sorry this part of um, cybersecurity where you investigate different uh, hacks already happened, incident response and stuff like that. So if you really um, evaluate furthermore uh, on this topic, of course, you become an expert, but on cyber forensics only. If you are a penetration tester, if you are looking for vulnerabilities in the infrastructure of, uh, of the companies, which are your clients, and if you furthermore um, you know, put on efforts and uh, knowledge and educate yourself in the, in in this field of a penetration tester, then you become just an expert in a penetration tester. Yeah. My point is that if you want to become an expert on cybersecurity, then you have to put a lot of efforts in different fields because a cybersecurity expert is a person who has a broad overview of everything what's going on there. If you are, if you already, if you really want to become a cybersecurity expert, you have to have a knowledge about cyber forensics, penetration testing, about consultancy. So mm -hmm. to understand how to uh, implement different controls in the infrastructure, um, even when we talk about networking, to have a basic understanding in the beginning, but also then to furthermore improve your understanding about how different devices like intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, firewalls, honeypots, how the infrastructure, how the network itself operates so that to have a broad overview, how to protect your organization. Mm -hmm. So the position of the cybersecurity expert is the position of a person who takes care about all the different aspects, aspects aspects of the organization, meaning that you have to have really understanding about everything that. So how you should start with, yeah, of course, um, it's very, very related uh, maybe with networking. So if you have a networking background, this will be a very good start for you just to jump and just to switch to start working on to become cybersecurity expert. But also if you are a developer, this might be also very important for you, especially some of the languages like PHP, JavaScript, which are now more and more uh, used in uh, web application writing, for instance, mm -hmm. the front end. Um, and when we talk about penetration testing, especially web application testing, you cannot go without having knowledge about PHP and JavaScript nowadays. Yeah. So my point is how you can become a cybersecurity expert. A lot of years of experience, and believe me, a lot of dedication of your time in all the different aspects of the cybersecurity field. <laughs> okay, and the last question for today is, um, do you think the demand of uh, cybersecurity experts will increase? Oh yeah, indeed. Uh, 
and some of the uh, researches about IBM, for instance, if I'm not wrong, uh, in the in the last uh, in the last couple of months for 2019, they have estimated that uh, by the end of 2020, there will be a gap of 3.5 million cybersecurity experts globally. Uh, so you can imagine how you know a big number of uh, cybersecurity professionals is that. And moreover, the COVID infection will will pass at some stage, and I I hope it will be by the end of April, <laughs> yeah. or I hope so, uh, at least in the beginning of May. I but thought that you will say at the end of the year, but no, no, no. I'm I'm a positive, <laughs> I'm optimistic. So yeah, I, I think that uh, the Bulgarian government is doing really well, uh, a great job actually to to keep really yeah. this infection in the minimum uh, levels of, uh, of being infected the people. Uh, so I really expect uh, expect that by in the beginning, let's say in May. Probably we will already pass this this um, this phenomena, this uh, pandemic infection. Um, but with this pandemic infection, we see that now businesses are thinking more and more about transforming, uh, digitalizing their business. Meaning that even after this infection, in my opinion, the need to transform your business into the <coughs> into the digital space will be even more and more uh, which the businesses are looking for and as the businesses are moving more and more to the cloud and to the you know to the uh, cyber security uh, field meaning that more and more people cyber security professionals will will be needed and now we see that the ministry of education a uh, lot of conferencing is taking place there. It's another way of gap where actually the attackers can attack us on using the different conferencing tools. If they are not protected, they can easily sniff this conversation, which means that because I've heard the, the Minister of Education was saying that even after the, the COVID-19 infection, they will try to push this way of you know a digital, uh, digital education, which means on the other hand, that they will need uh, consultancy. They yeah. will need the support for from cybersecurity professionals in order not just to transform this business into the cloud, but also to better protect it. So my point is, now we see all the advantages of working remotely, of using cyber and internet and the digital advantages, which means that after that, a lot of the businesses will still want to remain there, which means that they will need to hire, they will need the consultancy of cybersecurity professionals. So yeah, I definitely foreseen that the demand of, uh, of uh, the need of cybersecurity professionals will rise, will grow by the end of this year and in the next couple of years. And especially this, um, this service, which is called managed service, managed cybersecurity services, because many businesses, they will not have enough money or efforts to hire a cybersecurity professional to educate, to train yeah. him, to certify him. And, and also he will need a lot of expertise. He will need a lot of years of experience in order really to be a good cybersecurity professional. But on the other hand, outsourcing is definitely what Bulgaria is famous with. Yeah. So outsourcing of cybersecurity is, uh, is, is rising and is getting more and more popular. So instead of companies hiring such professionals, they can easily just outsource this kind of services uh, to somebody else, to another company, which can actually manage this uh, this uh, this solution, these services on behalf of them. Yeah, and this is a really good solution most of the times. Okay, so uh, Lubu, thank you for your participation. It thank you for inviting me. It was me. really a great uh, <laughs> conversation, and I hope uh, the guys who are listening to us really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you too, and thank all the listeners. Bye bye. Bye bye.